Our topic this morning is COVID-19, climate change, political corruption, and the NSL, or the National Sunday Law. Uh, start from uh, the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 18, uh, starting in verse, eight, uh, verse 24 through verse 32. 2 Samuel, chapter 18, beginning in verse 24 through verse 32. And so the Bible says that, And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate into the wall and lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king, and the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near, and the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Me thinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man and cometh with good tidings. And Ahimeaz called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which have delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my Lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And the high has answered, When Joab sent the king's servant and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And behold, Cushai came. And Cushai said, Tidings, my lord, the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, the enemies of my lord, the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. We, we know the story that, Dan, uh, that David uh, had fled from his son. His son was seeking for, for his life and would have killed him had he had the opportunity. And in the providence and the mercy of God, that was not to be because God had ordained, he had planned for David to be able to rule Israel. And it was not to be usurped from him by Absalom. And his, his plan was that after David, then there would be Solomon and so forth with the, the dynasty go on. But this is now being challenged. It's all being brought into question by the uh, pompous attitude of this son, Absalom. And after Absalom is brought uh, to his counselors, he makes a plan that he's going to be able to to smash and to take Jerusalem. He's going to break off their loyalty to David. He's going to show himself as being the, the king of Israel. He's going to establish himself as being a man that is open to the needs of the people and not a, a, a ruler as David was. And he has tried this, and he has had some success to a limited degree. And in the culmination of the story that we read in 2 Samuel 18, verse 24 through 32, uh, Absalom has come to his end. He had been suspended between the branches of a mighty oak, and David's general, Joab, saw him there and took darts out, and he threw and thrust him through his heart, and he killed Absalom there. And he had sent word out so that David would know that, that all is well, that the rebellion has been, been crushed, and you are now able to come back, and everything is fine. And so um, these two men leave out, Ahimeaz and Cushai. And one of them, Ahimeaz, according to what David said, the day that he was known for bringing good tidings. And in those days, to get battle updates, there would always be a messenger. A messenger would come giving information to say, this is what has happened, and this is how the battle is faring, and so forth. It was customary for kings to be out in battle, but after David had nearly died before one of the, the Philistine giants, Israel said, no more, we don't want you to go to battle any longer. And so David stayed here, uh, and in this particular instance, when the word came from the battlefield, Ahimeaz didn't want to say what was wrong. 
And you probably have been in those situations before where you, you know what the answer is, you know the information, but you don't want to say it. You don't want to be the bearer of bad news. I mean, and it's hard sometimes to tell people bad news. It's hard sometimes to tell people that the loved one is not going to be okay. It's hard sometimes to tell people that, they're, uh, that what they had hoped for is not going to happen that way. You don't want to be the one to, to have to bear that. You want somebody else to do it. And so this is the dilemma that Ahime is. is he, he runs there, and he's carrying a message, but he, he does not want to convey what is there. And so he makes up this story. And in, in, in some respects, the story probably was true. I mean, on, on face value, that there was a tumult. There was a lot of things that were taking place. Uh, but certainly the, 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 post, the portion that um, he is saying is that I don't know what the outcome is. You know. That certainly was not the case. But he did not want to be the person to bring this information. And so then it was, and Cushai came forth, and Cushai said, well, look, King, this is what happened on the battlefield, and I would hope that all your enemies are as that young man. And the king, when he heard that, of course, knew now that, that without a doubt, Absalom was dead. Uh, and so he turns in the verses that we have not listed, and he begins to cry out and to moan, uh, and to bemoan the loss of his son. He says, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, with God, I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son. And when the people heard that, they weren't quite sure what to make of it. Because here it is that they had risked their lives by their association with David. They, they've left out because they're saying, hey, we're going to be true to you. And now when the word comes back that the instigator of the rebellion that he has put down, they're not quite sure what to make of his emotions. Because they, they would have thought that he may would have said, well, I'm glad the rebellion is down. And that would be a hard position to be in. Because the rebellion is down, but your son is dead. It was similar to when Aaron had to uh, deal with the loss of Nadab and Abihu. And what they had done was wrong, uh, clearly. They had been instructed that when you go into the service of God, to the sanctuary, you're not to, to drink wine. And what do they do? They go and they, they drink wine. They are inebriated. They're drunk. They go inside the, the service to begin, but to begin to offer, and, and God shows his displeasure, and he strikes them down. And so uh, Aaron is, is, is a father, ready to weep. And so uh, Moses said, well, you can't cry. You must be able to accentuate that the fact that what they did, that this was wrong. And so after that, the, the, the initial removal, um, then Aaron was still saddened with grief. And Moses said, essentially, hey, I understand. It's okay to be sad. And even though your sons, now again, they died in rebellion. They died in transgression. Both instances, this, this was the case, that they both, uh, they both were in transgression. They both were in rebellion. But it was still, nonetheless, that they were, were fathers that wept over the decisions that their children made. Just because they had transgressed, it didn't mean that they were no longer their children. So it is, I believe, that they, and I know that God will weep over the decisions that his children make in choosing to be separate and separated from him. That he will weep. He will not rejoice. It will still be sadness when he sees uh, that his children would not be saved. The message that this uh, that Ahimeas carries, he was unwilling to give. Uh, the message that we carry, sometimes, sometimes, we're unwilling to give. It's, 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 it doesn't sound good. I'm gonna have to. Uh, looks like we're having some internet problems here connecting. So let me connect my. This. Um, I guess that's the beautiful thing of technology. When it works, it works. Uh, when it doesn't work, then there's a problem. Let's see if this will connect, and then we can go that way. Okay. OK, 
Okay, I think this may please connect us. It's uh okay. Yeah, well, they they'll be able to connect because I connected to the hotspot, so they'll be able to see. Let me just make sure this is uh un yeah. So they should be able to see. They'll be fine. So thank the Lord, He had a a ram in the thicket. I wasn't going to get a hot spot. Um, and like it was about, I don't know, three weeks ago or so forth. No, before coming up here. Um, it's to say, yeah, you know what? It's like, uh, I'll add it on and so forth. So anyway, um, God had, had, had knowledge, I guess we would be coming to this particular situation. So I thank him for that. So they're connected. They should be able to see online now because I'm online so they can see. So they're they're good. I don't know what the problem is here, but we're praying, um, and we're going to uh, start back again. So let's just uh, let's have prayer again, shall we? Okay, Father in heaven, we thank you for having a, a ram in the thicket for us, already making provision, and I just thank you that we're able to be able to uh, continue in our service. So be with us as we uh, as we study. Uh, we pray that you would uh, remove from us uh, the problem that we had, help it to be fixed and resolved. And so even in this uh, distraction. We give you the honor, we give you the glory for being able to work it out uh, for uh, those who are online to be able to still be able to, uh, to listen and participate in the worship experience. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so, yeah, they should be able to, uh, they should be able to see, because I, like I said, I am on, online. Oh, you can't, well, all right, I can unmute. Okay, all right, excellent. Uh, I can unmute from here and uh, join. Give me one second. Um, just don't want any, uh, avoid the feedback. Let's see. Audio. All right, so uh, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. All right, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Um, if you can, can hear, uh, just give me like a thumbs up in the chat so we'll know. Okay, all right, so they can hear um, there, so I think we may have. Fixed it, okay. So they can hear, and you can hear. So I think we're we're fine for now, okay. So we're looking at David, at David's experience, and the reluctance that Jaime has had. Well, as we carry the three angels' message to the world, there there could be a desire to have some reluctance there. How will it be perceived? How will it be received by individuals? And we can run out with it, and knowing full well what the outcome is, what it means. Uh, but yet, when the question is asked, well, what does all this mean, we might, like Jaime is, be unwilling to give the clear and uncut truth. This is what it is. Now, now certainly, certainly under the circumstances, there could be some empathy that would be placed in there. But the fact of the matter is that, that this is his son, but he's also a rebel. He's a rebel to the kingdom. It's hard to be able to separate those two uh, factions from each other, that it's his son but his son is also calling for his life. His son is in rebellion against the plan and the government of God. Cushai comes, and again, he lays it out that this is the case. In these last days in which we live, we know that our message, our message is very much relevant. It has not changed. We're still called upon to give it and to share with people so that people understand that we know. And yet with it, the question that we would ask ourselves is, is in carrying forth the message, we must not be afraid to share it, but we must be clear on what we're sharing. You see, Ahimeaz, he gave information that said that there was a tumult. I don't know what happened. There was a skirmish, but what the outcome was, I'm not really sure of that. But we must give a message with certainty. We must give a message that is unequivocal. We must give a message that is, is clear, that it is the main points are brought forth and that people understand and know that after engaging in discourse, we don't want them to leave more confused when they l finish the conversation than when they started the conversation. 
We want to teach them in such a simple manner that, that as it were, a child could grasp and understand. Uh, so our topic again this morning is uh, in relation to uh, multiple things, the COVID-19, climate change, political corruption, and the National Sunday Law. And I chose this topic because there is a, a lot of discussion uh, about each one of those components and so forth. And so, uh, really, our, our duty, our, our assignment is, well, let's look at it and understand. Now, I shared before, and I will share it, share it again, uh, probably to the, to, the day, to the day of my death, the truth loses nothing by investigation. One of my favorite statements and in inspiration. Truth loses nothing by investigation. I'm sort of paraphrasing that. In our search for truth, we remember uh, the book of Acts, chapter 17. The scripture says that these were more noble. Um, than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the word of God with all readiness of mind. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. I submit to us that, that searching the scriptures or studying a topic is not finding out what a person thinks about a topic and using that. Like, for instance, many times in, in churches, people will say, well, I'm going to study this out. And studying it out then is, okay, well, I'm going to reach out to this, uh, I'm going to watch this sermon, I'm going to read this article, I'm going to listen to this, and that is, is studying. That's not studying, that's listening. Studying is, is, is different from that, and, and that's definitely a good first start. But some people are like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study this out, whatever the topic happens to be, and the studying amounts to I'm going to watch a couple of sermons and get an idea of what, what that is. Again, that's listening. That, that's viewing. Studying is really uh, independently seeking to come to an understanding of a topic and looking it up. And, and researching it. I'm not saying you have to spend uh, countless hours and hours and hours of researching, but going up back to be able to look to see, does this, does this line up? Is this uh, what I'm understanding and what is the conclusion I'm drawing to? And, in school, they talk about you, you are to form, or in the scientific community, you may form like a hypothesis of what you, you think it is, and, and then you go about trying to be able to establish and define information. Not to read material to support it, but to, to really read material to follow it wherever it goes. Okay, where, wherever it goes. So I might think one way, but I must read all the material that's relevant. I'm not saying read every docu piece of documentation. No one can do that. Okay, so that um, all the material that's relevant is, again, it's, it's quantified uh, in some respect. But I read it, and I seek to read it with an unbiased uh, mind, with an, uh, an unbiased opinion. Even though I think this may be the case, I kind of lay that aside because I have to look and to find out, right? And so I begin to look and to see, and I'm following down based upon the weight of evidence. And so the weight of evidence is now going to determine what is the case. So uh, keep that in mind then as we talk. And so I would encourage us then, even with, uh, especially with this topic and with others, uh, you will have references and so forth. But again, don't just take those references. I think references are important because they can help us to be able to look in the context in which something was given. But keep in mind that even with references, that we can selectively pick portions out that say what we want it to say. And so it can be referenced, but and the reference may be there, but uh, looking at it in its entire context uh, is, is, is going to be beneficial to us as such. So you know, for the last two years, uh, we, we have been in... Uh, and some would say a pandemic. Okay, some would say it's a pandemic. Uh, but we have been facing a co coronavirus, COVID-19, and so forth. Now, there are all types of ideas in terms of how it started, where it started, and so forth. And I've already addressed a number of those things. But one of the popular ones is it started from uh, 5G technology, uh, from labs in China, and, and so forth. Uh, not going to explore those things again. We've done that before. In a book that was written in 1981, that this is where some base things on, in 1981 by Dean Kuntz, a book entitled The Eyes of Darkness. He talked about uh, a, a, uh, a biological weapon being made that is called Wuhan 400 uh, because it was developed in their RDNA labs outside of the city of Wuhan uh, and it was the 400th visible strain of man-made microorganisms created at, at that center, research center. And he talks about Wuhan 400 being a perfect weapon. Uh, now, some people look at that and say, okay, well, see, that's 
um, that's evidence there that, that uh, Wuhan 400, um, it was created, you know. And so there are a lot of people in the church that get their understanding of prophecy not, not based off of um, Scripture. It's not based off of the Bible. But a lot of it is based off of uh, their perception of what Hollywood does. And the, the, the premise is, is that Hollywood is setting us um, to show us what's taking place behind the scenes. And so what you see in Hollywood is a precursor of what will happen. And if you watch any of these videos or you read any of these newsletters and so forth, they will have different things that they will reference that this took place in Hollywood. And so when it happens in real life, then they say, look, there, there it is. This was in the movie, and these are insiders. These are the global elite. These are members of the Illuminati. These are Satanists. Uh, these are Rothschilds, Gilderbergers, and so forth. They're members of the Council of the Foreign Relations, et cetera, et cetera. They know all these things, and they are uh, um, writing about them before they happen. And in this particular case, then this would also fall into that train, uh, that, that Wuhan 400. And so Wuhan, of course with the, the city where uh, the spread of COVID began was Wuhan, China. And so they would point and say, well, see, this is a, the fact right here. This is Wuhan 400. It's telling you the name of the city and, and so forth, and then the, the description that is there. Uh, but what they often ignore, even in that, those movies um, that are oftentimes referred back to as showing us the future, um, of what fu the future will be like and so forth, and you've seen different ones. You've seen the ones where they have like half man, half animals? You've seen the ones where they have aliens that live in other planets and they come back and they take people and so forth? Like, well, okay, where's that line up with scripture? You know, if, if, if Hollywood is to be this purveyor of, of, of truth in that sense and showing us what's to take place, you know, how are they way off center? So you have, you know, the notion of, okay, Hollywood, you have the, uh, the, the half man, half beast mentality and so forth. And there are people today who believe that they are half man, half beast that live. And that they are walking around and this and so forth. And uh, this is part of uh, amalgamation. Well, you, you can be sure that it is impossible for a male or female to uh, give birth to a um, hybrid mixture of man and animal. Our DNA is similar, but it's not the same. It is impossible to be able to produce. Now, there are people who um, have sexual relations with animals and so forth, but you will not produce an offspring. Now, in Hollywood, you may have all these different things that are purported and, and that are presented, but, but people, uh, many in the church, will go to Hollywood for, to be their source of inspiration versus scripture. So um, in this, this uh, book that was Dean Kuntz, of course, it, and it's interesting, there's only a portion that is correct, because in this book, um, he talked about the fact that it, um, it can't survive outside of a living human body for longer than a minute. Well, we know that that's not true about the coronavirus. He also talks about in this book that they will, uh, people who, who receive it will die within 24 hours. We also know that that is not the case. Okay? So in other words, um, this is almost one of those things where you write about something and it, it, it comes true, but it's like uh, Nostradamus. Okay? You, um, you're going to write about something and something is going to happen, uh, but this is not, quote, evidence of a biblical fulfillment as such. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip here. Uh, in the interest of time. But the idea, though, is that behind the scenes that there are different groups that are controlling and pulling the strings. And so the people that we see, the politicians and the leaders, that these are all, all puppets. And so everyone is set up. There are puppets that are in the churches. There are puppets that are in the government. There are tr uh, puppets that are in every in businesses. So that really behind the scenes you have this uh, grand power that is moving, that Satan is, is moving them as uh, caricatures or uh, marionettes. And they're there simply following biddings. And so these meetings take place in the veil of secrecy, and there's a, a grand scheme to be able to pull and to cover. 
And so we'll, we're going to look at that um, in relation to, again, the topic that we're, uh, that we're discussing. What do these things have to do with the National Sunday Law? Because there is a, and I'll stop here, there's a premise to interject this. There is a premise then um, that COVID-19 is really a, um, a test to prepare the world for the Sunday Law. And you may have heard that, you may not have heard that, but that's, that's a very popular notion that COVID-19, this is all, this is, uh, whether it's man-made or real, uh, whether it's a hoax or not, this is a, a dress rehearsal for the Sunday Law. That climate control and what's taking place there, that this is all preparation for the National Sunday Law. So my objective in this morning, just to be clear, is I want to look at history. We'll look at some statements from the pen of inspiration, and when we have concluded today, We'll be able to look at these events and to make a determination to say, well, are they or are they not? If they are, why, what is the evidence? If they are not, what is the evidence? But most importantly, then, what does the scripture teach us? What does uh, the pen of inspiration teach us? So I have a couple of pieces to reference. Um, this photo, while it may look like it is from today, it is not. Um, this photo was taken in the turn of the century uh, in Philadelphia. And I want to read a piece that comes from it. Just, just forget the dates and just see, does it sound like anything that you may have heard recently? It says, the epidemic is assuming more serious proportions. If the people are careless, thousands of cases may develop, and the epidemic may get beyond control. Okay, now skip the big portion of it that talked about the year, but does that sound like anything that, that you have heard in the news? I'll say so, yes. Okay. Uh, now here's a response. What are they trying to do? Scare everybody to death? The fear of COVID is creating a panic. Steer clear of it, therefore, and talk of cheerful things of health uh, and the other portion that come in there, basically of, of uh, more favorable things. Does that sound like anything today? Yes. Can I change the names? Uh, this was a uh, influenza in 1918, okay? But I changed the name at the end. So it sounds like that. And so maybe we might say anything. We can say history uh, then maybe repeats itself. The characteristics of history repeats itself. So this that we are facing is not unprecedented. The, the very word unprecedented refers, infers that this is something we've not seen before. As, as Bible students, and I would also encourage us to be history students too. Because when we talk about prophecy, prophecy, as we say, is history written in advance. And how do we know that it's taking place? Well, we understand it by the uh, knowledge of history. So if I change out some of these different pieces and remove 1918 and put 2018 or whatever, 2020 and 2021, uh, that will kind of set it in its order. But that was the mindset. So really had like a couple of things. If some people are saying, well, you know what, uh, we need to be concerned. Other people say, ah, you know, don't make such a big deal out of it, okay? Um, that was uh, one uh, notion that was there. Uh, you can't see the top of this, but when we talk about the vaccines and so forth, because people say, well, look, this is all a setup for the government to take control and to tell you what you can and can't do. Um, how many of you knew or know, well, no, let me rephrase the question because I may give away the answer and how I state it. Can the government mandate for you to take a vaccine if it is in the interest of public safety? I'm talking about in the good old U.S. of A. Can the government mandate that you must take a vaccine if it is in the good of public safety? Okay. When I say mandate, let me be clear. Can they pass a law to say uh, all of the citizens must get a vaccination by this date if it is in the interest of public safety? Or can they not do it? I mean, do they, do they have the, when I say the power, let me, let me clean, uh, clarify what I mean. People have the power to do anything, okay? So uh, I'm not using it in that loose sense. I'm using it specifically meaning, um, does the government have the authority to be able to come forth and to say, uh, to be able to combat this, we want everyone, we're mandating that by this date, everyone get a vaccination. That's, really, that's what my question is. How many would say yes to that? Yes. Say, many say no to that. Uh, it's interesting, okay? Um, in 1905, in 1905, um, the Supreme Court heard a case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts. 
And in it, they upheld the compulsory vaccination during a smallpox outbreak. Now, now I want you to notice what this is saying. Uh, it, it explained, quote, that the liberty secured by the Constitution of the United States to every person within its jurisdiction does not import an absolute right in each person to be at all times and in all circumstances wholly freed from restraint. There are manifold restraints to which every person is necessarily subject for the common good. Upon the principle of self-defense of paramount necessity, a community has the right to protect itself against an epidemic of disease which threatens the safety of its members. All right, so what, what do we just read here? Uh, so this is a part of the um, opinion or the brief that was issued. And simply what it says that this is that the Supreme Court has already voted in 1905 that the government does have the right to be able to mandate vaccinations if it is deemed in the best interest due to public safety. Now, uh, why do I again bring this up? But bring it up because um, uh, in the church, you will hear people saying that this is a, a sign of the mark of the beast. This is a sign that the government is exercising this authority. They are, are flexing its muscle to be able to implement the uh, national Sunday law, etc. Now, I'm not saying that the government should mandate it. Okay, this, that's not my point. My point is, is that history, this, is, this would not have been the first time, and it is not being mandated today. Okay, but my point being is that in 1905 that this was brought about. Now, you quickly, uh, you know that in 1905, was Ellen White still living or was she dead? Living. She was still living. Now, it'll be interesting and curious to note then, did she say anything about this? Because we, we're today drawing a conclusion to say, well, the government said we, uh, we have to, uh, to, to social distance. You have to do this and you have to do that. This is infringing upon our you know, religious rights and so forth, so on, et cetera, et cetera. This is uh, you know, setting up for the mark of the beast and so forth, okay? Did she draw those parallels? No. That'd be the question we would probably want to ask. Did she draw those parallels? Did she make those same assumptions? Did she warn then that, okay, the, the, what we see now that this is a, a pretense, this is a preparation, this is a setup? The answer is no. Now, okay, again, we can talk about, you know, whether we agree with it or disagree with it, right? You know, and you could be very opinionated, and I could be very opinionated whether we agree or disagree with it. But when we go so far then as to, to make the declaration that this is to set up for this, now that, that's, that's a little different from um, making uh, something that whether we agree or disagree. So the answer again is no. She didn't say a word about that. She did not address it or to view it in that light. Uh, in 19, 1894, while in Sunnyside, this is in Australia, Australia also dealt with the influenza pandemic. And this is what she wrote in uh, letter, 30, 18, uh, letter 30, August 13, 1894. This was a, to S.N. Haskell. She said, throughout New South Wales, we have been tested and tried with the influenza epidemic. Nearly every family has been afflicted in the cities and, and country towns. Some are now very, very sick. Their lives are hanging in the balance. We pray for the sick and we do what we can financially and then we wait for the result. Now, it's also interesting to me that she doesn't go into any uh, conspiracy. Now, now, today, we're deep into it. Now, uh, this is all created by the papacy to be able to take over the world. This was made by the, um, the global elite to be able to take over the world. This was made by, you know... Bill Gates to be able to take over this, you know, whoever it happens to be, just change the name, just put an X and draw it out and put somebody else there. Now, of course, um, being uh, Seventh-day Adventists, we're not necessarily going to say this person, that person. We might say them, but, but we view it in, in that, that bigger picture, that this is like a part um, of it to be able to, to take over the world. But, but again, notice, notice, uh, beloved, that, that she doesn't deal with any of those things. She doesn't talk about any of those things. 
She says, hey, this is a sickness or an illness that has taken place. And she then proceeds just to talk about different people's experiences, her experience, and that they continue to essentially trust God. Okay, it's going to be fine. We're going to continue to trust God and to be able to deal with this situation and to go through this ordeal by God's grace. Now, I want to also uh, draw your attention to the fact that in Australia, there were different places that they had set up uh, as quarantine areas. So I would encourage you to just Google it and look it up. There are different places they had in New South Wales, in um, Perth, etc., as places for quarantine. So it's not like a new concept that has been created. So when we look at the first piece then, we know, okay, um, the sickness was not used as a means historically to bring about the National Sunday Law. And we know what the, the, the um, climax of that was in the 1880s in America. Sickness was not, our disease was not a mechanism to be able to bring it about. That was not a concern that was being voiced. Number two, let's move quickly. Um, you've heard of the uh, peace, the Paris Climate Agreement uh, that was signed in uh, 2016 and was uh, by over 190 countries, I think 197 countries, signed the Paris Climate Agreement. And it was in, I think, 2017, 2018, that President Trump said, we're getting out of this piece uh, of the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, what, is it, uh, what are the components of the Paris um, Agreement on Climate Change? Well, it's really like three main components. Now, this, this piece is talked about universally that this is the Sunday Law, and that the Pope is going to use the Paris Climate Agreement to bring about the Sunday Law. Now, make no mistake about it. Uh, the Pope has issued an encyclical letter, Laudato Si, which he talks about the responsibility of, uh, of Christians to be able to certainly take care of the earth and its environment and so forth. And I, I looked through to see, um, read different portions and looked through to see, well, does he talk about worship? Is he talking about rest? What's being brought up there? Uh, I also read the Paris Agreement. It's like 28 pages, not, not really long. The Pope's letter was like 238 pages. I didn't have that much time to, to, to read 238 pages, so I just said, let me look, look for the main points that are there um, that are listed. But I read the Paris Agreement, and when I'm reading the Paris Agreement, it talked of uh, several areas that were of a concern. Number one, uh, it was really to uh, limit the effect of the rising of the temperature. They, they don't want the temperature on Earth to, to rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius. Number two, to look at every country's commitment that they would make to uh, avoid greenhouse gas emissions and so forth, um, to reduce their carbon footprint, and review this every three years, or every five years. And then number three was to look at those countries, like the developed countries such as America, Japan, um, Soviet Union, and so forth, would use their technologies and understanding to help developing nations so that they don't make the same mistakes and blunders that they have made. So those were the three things that were listed there. And of course, you can go in and, and look it up on the, uh, the UN website and to see. I want to emphasize that none of it talked about um, having a day off of worship. None of it spoke about having rest. They all dealt summarily with those three things. Th these three things were important uh, in their minds to be able to combat uh, climate change in the best way to be able to deal with it. But today, uh, when, when you hear of, of climate change, uh, then the notion is that this, this is it. This is what the Pope is going to use to bring about the Sunday law. The climate change is the, the catalyst that is going to, and I'll, I want to show you from uh, inspiration what we know about the Sunday movement. And, but it is interesting, again, that this is not um, listed as such. Again, I would encourage you to go, go read the document. It's not that long. You can just Google it, Paris Agreement, English version, download it and read it. And you'll, you'll find 
uh, the very same thing in which we are talking about this morning, that that is not listed there. Now, the Pope did uh, push for world leaders to sign this agreement. So well, why would he do that? Again, there's, there's no reference to it to um, Sunday. There's no reference to Sabbath, no reference to rest, nothing like that. And you know, of course, if you looked at the Vatican and some of its inner workings, that they have also spoken about, you know, human rights issues, uh, workers' rights, and so forth. Now, let's not be deceived. We understand that in the, in the end, right, the, the objective will be to establish, to, re to undo all that Protestantism has done. To regain its footing uh, over the world and to embrace then Sunday sacredness. So we want to be clear. We're not confused about the issue. Uh, that's very clear that that is what the, um, the agenda will be. That is what the, the scope of things will be. Uh, what, I am, uh, what I am differentiating in and in the things that are being used to be able to bolster up the claim, we have to have the evidence to be able to support the claim. Now, he has spoken again and said that we need to have responsibility. And, and now, granted, he is leading 1.3 billion followers on earth. There are 7.9 billion people that live on earth. A quick math, that's like one sixth, one seventh of the world's population are members of this church. As a, as a commitment, as a duty, there is a responsibility to go forth and to say we, we should do our best. Now, again, this is not embracing worship um, as such. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the push and what he is signing for and speaking for, when you look at these documents, has nothing at all to do with um, worship, has nothing to do with establishing a day of worship. It's all talking about, uh, hey, if we keep living the way we're living, there's not going to be an earth to pass on to our uh, posterity. Now, we understand that God was going to come before that. You know, we're not going to just kill ourselves off. Okay, that, that's the one thing we know as Christians, that we're not going to just kill ourselves off. Okay, um, that God has reserved this world. So it will not get to the point that we're going to just um, blow ourselves up with a nuclear explosion, a nuclear holocaust, everybody's going to die. We know that's not going to happen. We know we're not going to just run out of food and everybody's going to die off. We understand that that's not going to happen. We know there's not going to be a global flood. We understand that that's not going to happen. We know that a meteorite is not going to hit the earth and kill everyone. You know, so we can eliminate those things, right? We, we have a clear distinction as to this is what will take place according to the scope of Scripture. So the pictures that you see on your screen, then, these are uh, like kind of before and after, uh, like with uh, really what happened. Uh, was it rain? No, it was... Uh, Basically, COVID. So people weren't able to get out, uh, you know, couldn't work. So the streets got a little clean, cleaner. Um, pollution went away. Uh, was mitigated to a great degree. Shouldn't say went away, um, but a great change was there. Now, in 2021, um, the COP26 uh, climate summit. Again, Pope Francis he uh, called for radical action from the leaders of the world to be able to address and to take on this particular issue. It's an issue that certainly is near and dear to him, but understand again in it um, that the emphasis again was on the responsibility of a, like an ecological crisis, it was called. An ecological crisis. And that as a response then that there must be some uh, change that takes place in how we are living and how we are conducting ourselves and using the resources of, of Earth. Uh, so how do we get into a lot of these things? Um, of course, in the, you probably, if you've seen any um, Jan Markinson's videos, you've probably seen this gentleman. Uh, That's Alberto Riviera. Uh, and he was uh, purported to be an ex, uh, a former Jesuit priest. And so his claim to fame really was a talk of the, uh, the inner workings of the papacy and so forth. Uh, it, it is debated whether or not maybe this was indeed true or not, you know, but nonetheless, that was what he, he stated. And so a lot, of, a lot of the ideas that circulate today is based upon the premise, again, of this uh, secret organization and doing various works. Now, we know, we understand, not, there's no confusion there, that the role of the papacy is to, again, have global dominance, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, Daniel chapter 7. We understand that. 
But in much of what uh, circulates today uh, in the church, uh, much of it finds its root in uh, Alberta Riviera. You know, it's, it was interesting um, that uh, the assassination of John Kennedy, um, he along with others said, well, John Kennedy, he didn't die. You know, he, he survived the, the shot. This was all staged, and he went and lived on an island in the, in the Caribbean. That his son, so others will say, well, the son's not dead. Um, that, the, you know, the, this is all man-made. And, and the thing is, it's hard sometimes to be able to disprove some of these things. Uh, because what you might try to show to disprove it is the people confirmation. And now today, uh, Joe Biden is the president of the United States of America. And by his religion's uh, affiliation, Joe Biden is Catholic. Only the second Catholic to be elected to be president of the country. Now we know that John Kennedy was assassinated, and so there are you know a number of different things around uh, that that people say, well, this is you know questionable and so forth and so on and so forth. Now, if if Joe Biden, I hope he doesn't, but if he were to pass or to die in office, you know that there's going to be a bunch of ideas around it, a bunch of ideas around it. So we must go from being conspiracy-based uh, to, again, being a Bible-based people. What, of, of, uh, what should we see? So, again, the climate change, yes, um, Ladato C, he wants, uh, he looks at the um, problems that exist uh, in society, certainly uh, the breakdowns that we see that if men would embrace the Eucharist in, in Sunday, having a day of rest, this will help to set things in order. So look, we, we don't want to forget that. We don't want to overlook that, okay? Um, that, that's important. But, but please keep in mind um, that fundamentally, when you talk of, say, the Paris Climate Agreement and so forth, it's not like something that's anti-biblical. Revelation says that, that um, God is going to punish those that destroy the earth. So I'm not saying that if you don't dump your bottle in the right thing that you can, you're going to be punished. That's not the idea. But, you know, we should take some responsibility. But we recognize that the earth is not, um, it, it is a living organism, but it's not, quote, unquote, a spiritualistic thing and so forth. But what are some things that are taking place? I want to just to point out a couple of things um, and then transition. Uh, it says that uh, plans to move forward for the, uh, the Pope and the Russian patriarch to meet. Now, this was significant. This was in December of 2021. Uh, it says that, that essentially in 2016 uh, that the uh, Pope met in uh, the airport with Patriarch Kirill and they had this meeting that had not take, taken place since the schism between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church in 1054. So it's like a thousand years nearly had elapsed between the last time these two had met. So it lets us know then that this moving in the agenda, it, it is, it, it's there. Okay? Uh, the, the religious leaders of the world, they will come in line. The peoples of the world, they will come in line. And so I, I highlight this because, again, this was just a couple of weeks ago, and they said, we're going to meet in 2022. Uh, and they're going to discuss some of those differences that are there. So it is certainly going to take place. And they're continuing to meet to be able to bring those things into line. Uh, well, what of uh, uh, our day? Okay. So now with political arena. Uh, it's an interesting picture there uh, because some people say, well, the reason why President Trump fell out of favor and did not win re-election is because he backed out of the Paris Climate Agreement. And the Pope, he refused to kiss the Pope's um, finger or f when they met. And when generally you meet the Pope, one of the things you do is you, you kiss his hand. And some say, well, this is, the, this, this is because he wouldn't kiss his hand, he was like giving um, a finger to the Pope. And so there are a lot of people who then uh, rally around President Trump because they say, well, he's, he's against the, uh, the, the Vatican, he's against the Pope. And so he becomes like a, 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 uh, a hero 
to some because of that. And so because he did not uh, play along with the papacy, he was not able to win re-election. But if he would have gone along, then he would have won. And one of the biggest things he did to offend was the, um, the climate um, agreement. But well, we all know that just a few days ago, there was again a review or anniversary of the things that we saw of the, the riot uh, that took place on January the 6th of last year. Now, again, when you get deep into it, people start going on to a bunch of conspiracies. But the idea, what is the idea? The idea that people are percolating and, and is percolating in the church is that all these things are taking place because this is, the, um, this is like the grand plan of the papacy to be able to take over the world. This is the grand plan, the grand scheme. And again, you, you, don't, but you don't have any evidence to be able to corroborate these things. Isn't it interesting you don't have any evidence for these things? You know, JFK is alive on an island. We have no evidence for it. We have all these clandestine meetings taking place. We have no evidence for it. What we do have evidence for, we can certainly see, but then people say, well, they only let you see what they want you to see. And so then really what you have to do is you have to trust us and the knowledge that we have because we're able to uh, enlighten your eyes. In the book of Revelation, there was a group of people called the Gnostics, in chapter 1. Start reading through Revelation. Uh, the, the, the Gnostics in, in uh, the book of John, 1 John, you also see this group coming into light. And one of the things that they, they prided themselves on was having like this secret light that no one else had. And, and they, as the purveyors of this light, then they would, would share it. No one else had access. No one else knew. But you had to be like uh, brought into this inner circle to be able to have this. If you were not in the inner circle, you wouldn't know these things, but if you were in the inner circle, you would be able to have access and be able to have exposure to them. And I, I would submit uh, maybe, maybe we have fallen into a similar situation as well, that people think that they have, okay, we have this, this light that is there. You're like, well, how do you have it? Well, you have to believe that something happened um, and that I have information that will speak to it. I remember uh, I made the, the foolish mistake, um, but we all make foolish mistakes. Uh, I... I read an article, it was in, uh, it was a newsletter by Jan Marcus, and I will say his name only because I want to reference the newsletter that I read. And it, this was in 1996 or something like that, 1995, 1996, some, somewhere in there. And this was the time in which Janet Reno uh, had, she was the Attorney General for the, uh, for the United States, and this was after Waco. And in it, 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 it quoted an interview that she gave to 60 Minutes. And in the interview to 60 Minutes, it, it went something like this. Uh, the reporter asked, but like, what, what is a cult? And she gave the definition that a cult is anyone that essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, would give religious organizations money, you know, or, or they would believe in the, um, the teachings of the Bible. They believe in like homeschooling. They believe in, like, separation of church and state and so forth. It was like, you know, this list of things. And as, and as I'm reading the list, I'm like, man, that sounds like, like Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, it was like almost like, you know, they give to organizations. They believe in end-time events. They believe that the government will someday become corrupt and try to uh, kill its citizens. And I'm like, man, that sounds like, you know, this sounds like they're talking about us. Like, it's like maybe seven things, like six of them are us. And so what I do, you know, since it had 60 minutes in there and the date that the broadcast was on, uh, you know, I'll tell you this, you know, I'm going to tell people about this. So um, next service, that was part of what, was, uh, what I talked about, you know, had it right there, boom, 60 minutes. Then a couple of years after the fact, I said, you know what, maybe I ought to look this up. Maybe I ought to watch it with my, with my own eyes and see it and hear it with my own ears because at this point I'm only going off of the reference that, that he has given and I need to check it out. So uh, I get online and I type in the information and I go to 60 Minutes website and I look for it and uh, the, the date is not there. She, you know, it's like, okay, this, the date that is given is not the date that she's there. 
keep doing some more digging on it and can't find the information. So I said, okay, well, let me just um, reach out to 60 Minutes and, and find out, you know, because maybe I just had something wrong. So I reached out to 60 Minutes and they said, no, we, you know, Janet Reno wasn't here during, you know, whatever this, this whole time period was. I did some more research and like, okay, that's not, it's not lining up. So I called into the, uh, his office and said, well, hey, you know, I'm looking at this. Um, I wanted to get some information on it. And the lady was like, yeah, you know, she, you know, yeah, that was a really situation that she talked about. I said, well, I can't get the verification of it, you know, that it took place at 60 Minutes. And she, so she ended up telling me that uh, a friend of hers, a friend of a friend was there and heard it. I'm like, what? You got me. Here I am looking like a fool saying that this took place, that this woman said this, this, and this, and this documented and so forth. And the evidence that you give now to support is a friend of a friend of a friend was there and heard this. And of course, of course, now, granted, now 60 Minutes are, are Janet Reno. They're going to deny it because, you know, it's, it's like it's the truth that that got out. Because that could be the other side you could come back to it, right? You could say, well, you know, they don't want people to know, therefore they, they are, are distancing themselves from it and so forth. But it puts you in a situation, uh, and ultimately, of course, she was not there, but it puts you in a situation where people make these statements, and if a statement can't be verified, then it's, it, it can't be pushed as true. Remember, look, think of it as when the disciples were there uh, to talk about the Lord's resurrection. They knew it was true because, A, the word said it, but, B, they also... Um, Peter says, hey, we're not telling you some cunningly devised fable. We're talking about what we have seen and what we have heard, what our hands have handled. So don't, don't follow what I am saying because I'm giving, this is not hearsay. This is not secondhand information. This is a firsthand account of what I have seen, what I have been a witness to as such. So let's look at a couple of pieces very quickly before we, we close. Uh, one, I want to look at, well, who is really driving this movement? Okay, and, uh, number one. She says, the Sunday, law, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. Now, I want to stop and just, you know, full stop, period. This does not mean that there are some clandestine, secretive meetings that are taking place. That's how some people present it, that it's making its way in darkness. And so you think, okay, well, they're meeting at 12 o'clock at night, you know, in a secret chamber somewhere, um, at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. That's not what it's talking about. It is using the, 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 the word almost as a, as a metaphor, as making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issues, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending. They are working in blindness. But now notice who is doing this. In 1888, she is talking about what was taking place in America, okay, meaning the propagation and the then the building then of this bill was called the Blair Bill from Senator Blair. And all she is saying is that, that the, there are other religious leaders and so forth. There are people who want to bring this to pass. They don't really understand and, um, as what it is. And when it was being brought forth by Blair, it was not as such we're going to have a whole day that we're going to worship God and that will be the whole, whole thing. That was, it was built upon um, rights, uh, being able to rest, and it was an issue of the, of the fair, the World Fair, um, coming to the states, I believe Chicago at the time, and having Sunday off um, as a day of work, uh, as a day of rest. She says, they do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that they have been ma made them a free, independent nation and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. Be, cl be clear, those that are leading the movement, um, these are um, the religious leaders who will bring this about, who are bringing it about. Well, what is behind it? Great Controversy, page 592, says, Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Now, now, now notice that, that it says that political corruption 
has destroyed the love of justice and regard for truth. And that elected officials, in order to secure public favor, are going to yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. So who is making the demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance? Because what, what people would present is that the Pope is going to pick up the phone and call up the president and just say, I want you to do this. And, and that, that he has it set up now because, you know, Biden is, is, is Catholic, so all he's going to do is just pick up the phone and call Biden and say, Biden, I want you to do this, this, and the other. Is that what this is? Mm -mm. What does it say? Where is this going to come from? Is it going to come from the top, meaning the leaders, or is it going to demand come from the bottom? It's come from the bottom. Okay, it's from the people. The people are going to say, this is what we want. And the leaders are going to say, well, you're, we're going to give you what you want because we want to stay in office. We want to keep our constituents happy. So they will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Now, again, that doesn't fly, again, with the narrative that, that is put out there. The popular narrative is, is that, you know, that, that, that COVID is created by the Catholic Church, that this uh, climate change is created by the Catholic Church to be able to take over the world and so forth. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying at all that people can't use things for their own purposes. But I am saying the supposition that this is created, this is done for this intent, and this is how he's going to use it and so forth. Um, this is the point I am saying that, hold, hold on, we have to draw the line because this says that it's the public that will demand this to be done. Further, it says, Satan puts in his interpretation upon events, and they think as he would have them that the calamities which fill the land are a result of Sunday breaking. Thinking to appease the wrath of God, these influential men make laws enforcing Sunday observance. Now we get a, a clearer, uh, another layer that is added on to it. As calamities fall upon the land, then so we know then, okay, we're going to have calamities that take place uh, in the country. And that these, uh, through these disasters uh, and so forth, that people are going to say, they're going to link and say, well, this is a result of violating the Sunday Sabbath. And we need to be able to avoid these calamities by giving God the reverence that he truly deserves. This very class, in Great Controversy, page 587, this very class put forth the claim that the fast-spreading corruption is largely attributable to the desecration of the so-called Christian Sabbath and that the enforcement of Sunday observance would greatly improve the morals of society. This claim is especially urged in America where the doctrine of the true Sabbath has been most widely preached. So again, um, it's important to note, according to Revelation chapter 13, that America is going to be at the forefront and that it will be Protestants in America that will be at the forefront in being able to bring this about. So it will not be, as it were, Rome dictating to America. Rather, it will be America reaching out and embrace to Rome. Great Controversy, page 589, it says, While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disasters until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The mo earth mourneth and fadeth away. Uh, the, the haughty people do language. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws. They have changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. So in the pur purview of Scripture, Scripture is saying that the problems are coming because we have stepped away from God. But man will also see that as the problems of coming, that men have stepped away from God, but their re resolution resolve will be to go to God in a wrong way. We're calling the verse page 509. 
when the great deceiver will persuade, and then that great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to, the, to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Thus the accusation urged to vote against the servant of God will be repeated and upon grounds equally well established. So what does it tell us? Um, it lets us know that again that, that there will be um, a troubling that will take place through disasters. Um, and men will associate that as a sign that we've lost the divine favor of God. Now I'm not talking about maybe one person because you're going to always have uh, one person over here or there saying something. Okay, But I'm talking about when there is a general swell. Of, of people saying something, uh, meaning that um, here, not isolated, because you can, you can find uh, an isolated instance. You can show me an article of one person saying, well, these problems are coming because we're not um, following God and obeying um, the Sabbath, the Sunday Sabbath. The impact of this in great controversy is not isolation. It's not like one person or two people. Rather, it's, it's a global uh, event that is taking place that, that's a groundswell of people seeing something. So think about the, uh, the demonstrations that took place in 2020 uh, for Black Lives Matter. That was not like one place. Okay? You had, you know, city after city after city, you know, joining, saying, hey, we're going to march and so forth. Okay? This is what I'm talking about, like a groundswell. So, you know, if you just point out uh, one march, th that's nothing. But when you can identify, okay, well, there are hundreds of marches that are taking place with thousands upon thousands of people and so forth, you know, wh whether it's Black Lives Matter or whatever the case may be, um, that, that, that um, gives us an idea. And so, again, I want to draw us to what she is saying is that the masses of people in America are going to make forth this declaration. They're going to say that we need to restore the divine favor and temporal prosperity. Well, who's driving this then? Who's driving the vehicle? Protestantism, Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power. Then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation, and then it is that God will do his strange work in the earth. It gets clear in Last Day Events, page 131. When the leading churches of the United States, upon, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions. Now, um, I could have probably read that at the beginning and just saved us a um, better part of 50 minutes. It's not going to be brought about by martial law. Th that's out there as well, no. Uh, that, look, look the, the president has executive orders, and he's going to be able to bring about the, um, the Sunday is going to be by executive order and, and that all these things are setting up. He's going to have executive order and he has a right to be able to, to, to call and to do this and so forth. Well, that's not what this says. Okay, executive order is one branch of government, um, in this case, the president, making a decision. And, and, um, and generally speaking, executive orders are temporary. But that, again, that does not fly by what we have read. Everything we have seen thus far talks about who is being, who is the person that is saying we want this? The people saying it. Or it's not, not one person or, or a group of persons. It is the people saying this is what we want. This is what we desire. And as a result, it is the legislators who then say we're going to give you what you want. Legislators are also being influenced as well by religious leaders saying, hey, the calamities and the problems that we're seeing is a, is a result of this violation that's taking place. Okay, so now, now we're seeing uh, from inspiration what the case is. Does she ever talk about, well, the Pope's going to reach out and tell America that they need to do this? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nor is it suggested that he's hoodwinking the nations to do this. Under a ruse. Rather, it is clear then that it is America that is going to be 
uh, at the forefront. Last day events, page 132, it says, to secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. Lastly, testimony to, to the church, volume 6, page 395. It says that foreign nations will follow the example of who? Of the United States. Now, no, again, I, I can't deal with all the ideas and so forth that are out there, but one of the, the more popular ones now is that, that Sunday laws are going to be tested in these other na nations first. You know? so, so when you look at these other nations first, they're going to test it out, and then it's going to come to America like in a revival. Well, no, that's not what this says. I so, said, well, look, you know, the, 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 uh, this nation shut down because of, of COVID. And I um, heard someone say, well, you know, the, this nation, they, they shut down. And the only day they said was, um, was uh, the day that was locked down was Sunday. And so you see, that means that, that Sunday is now being established as a day of worship. Now, now think about that for a minute. And I, I think we're not going to get finished. But think about that for a minute. I say, well, why would a nation say shut down one day out of the week to stop the spread of COVID? How is it going to stop in one day? That's what the idea is. Okay? And so it's postulated as such. Like, that sounds crazy. You can't stop the spread in one day. And why would they pick Sunday? Well, generally speaking, I don't think they're going to probably pick Monday through Friday because those are generally working days. Okay, I don't, so I don't think that's going to happen. So really, by default, leaves you two days left, Saturday and Sunday, that there's going to be an, an option to be able to say, well, let's, uh, if we have to have a lockdown, we're going to pick one of those days. Traditionally speaking, um, most people are going to rest on Sunday. Not, not generally speaking, okay, so I'm not em embracing it. I'm just saying this is not an act of worship, okay? It's not about worship. And I'm saying, okay, um, to have off. And they say, well, you know, have off and, and everyone go to church on Sunday or we're going to push you to go to church. We can have a different conversation. Uh, the idea, though, is to be able to break up so that everyone is not together, social distancing and so forth. But they look and say, well, look, over here, they're, they're testing it here. So, so again, the devil isn't going to test Sunday in these different countries and nations and bring it to America. Revelation chapter 13, it says, all the world wandered after the beast. It would be America first, so essentially America does these things, and then all the other nations, they get on board. It's not the, the tail that's wagging the dog. It's the dog that's wagging the tail. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, Yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. So then we can, again, we can dismiss that notion uh, that that is uh, the case that some would suggest. And say, look, you know, they have, um, the, and, and again, different countries have whole different uh, rules of government. There's some countries have military rules. Some countries that they have a president. Some countries they have a parliament. I mean, it's very things that are there. But people make it as such, and so it ties into that. So again, we're back to, uh, well, what does the scripture say? Uh, I'm going to stop here. I don't know if there's more left or not, but I'm going to stop after these three. Uh, we read the first one already. It says, a history will be repeated. I meant the second. False religion will be exalted. The first day of the week, a common working day, po possessing no sanctity, whatever, will be set up as the image of Babylon. All nations and tongues and peoples will be commanded to worship the spurious Sabbath. The decree is enforcing the worship of this day is to go forth to all the world. Uh, volume 6, page 18 says, As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. I don't believe it can be any clearer than that, that America must lead, and that all the others are going to follow. And when she begins to bring persecution, so uh, the others will bring persecution as well. 
And as she divorces herself from righteousness, from this act and this decree, so all the other nations on the earth as well will divorce themselves from righteousness by this decree. So we look in scripture and in inspiration, then it gives us a clearer understanding. And so I would appeal to us then that as we go forth uh, with, with our message, we can know for a certainty that our message is true, uh, that, that it will certainly come to pass. But we don't have to, uh, uh, to twist things to be able to make the point. We don't have to use things that are based upon speculation to be able to make the point. We can use the thus saith the Lord to be able to establish and to share. Uh, so when we look in the word, we know then that it is true, that it is accurate, and it is the word of the living God. And the Bible says in Revelation 22 and verse 20, it says that he who testifies to these things says, surely I come quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity of being able to, uh, to spend uh, this time this morning uh, with you. We pray that you would help us to just get